talk to you today about access to basic vet care. And I could have just called my talk access to basic vet care. But the point is that access to basic vet care saves lives. And these are some of the lives that have been saved by providing people with the resources and means to be able to provide basic medical care to their animals. So we're gonna talk about basic vet care today and what, what that is. We're gonna do that in three parts. First, we're gonna talk about what basic care is. And for any audience members, I know there were a few people in the last session on the management track and we talked a little bit about this. We're also gonna talk about what are the barriers to access and how we remove them or at least move the barriers over a little bit. And finally, we're gonna talk about the ASPCA's program as an example of a, a, a program that provides basic veterinary care. And throughout this talk, I would really like for it to be a conversation. So feel free, if you have a question, please raise your hand, shout, say hey, whatever it is to, um, for us to make sure that we're, we're talking to each other. So before we get too deep into the talk, um, I did have this great introduction, but let's, I'll reinforce it again and maybe find a few more things to talk about. Um, I did get the sense there might be some Canadians in the room. So show of hands, yeah, woohoo, okay, great. Um, I promise not to just focus on you, but I am a proud, can <laughs> proud Canadian. Um, grew up in a little bit of Ottawa, a little bit of Montreal. I went to the Ontario Veterinary College. Um, I've lived in New York City for almost 20 years now. Uh, with my family. There are a few of um, our creatures. And if you really want to get on my good side, um, let's talk Halloween. Our family's super into Halloween. Um, and I would love to share stories of flaming pumpkins and other various costumes. Um, I'd like to get a sense of who is in the room. Um, am I good? Is it a fair assumption that most people in the room are veterinarians? Veterinarian, yeah, okay, lots, of, okay, few. The last presentation I was in was management land. And that was like a little scary for me. So I'm amongst my people again, which is great. Um, how many of you work in a program where you are offering some either sp spay neuter or other basic medical services? Great, preaching to the choir, even better. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, you know, what basic services are. And like I said, feel free to jump in if you have um, a comment, a thought, a suggestion, because uh, this is all about us getting a chance to share information with each other. Let's talk about Antonio and his dog, Coco. Antonio is a gentleman, lives in Queens, New York, um, has this lovely young dog, Coco, who developed a skin problem. And Antonio brought Coco to a veterinarian, um, received some care of, of various sorts, and it reached a certain point where Coco wasn't getting better and he had run out of funds to provide care for Coco. And the solution that he came up with was to bring Coco to the, uh, the city shelter animal care centers of New York with the hope that someone else would be able to care for Coco. And there's a very fortunate thing in New York City that we've created a terrific partnership where if an animal is brought into the city uh, animal services, uh, and that there is a situation where perhaps it's medical related, that rather than having the person relinquish the animal, uh, it will be offered to them if they would like to come to the ASPCA's primary pet care services to see if there's something we could do to help. And again, I recognize a few faces from the last talk I was in, so don't, don't say all the answers. Um, but I, you know, taking care of Coco, you know, she's like a young dog, maybe four months old, um, really gross, stinky skin. Do you think we needed an MRI and a CT scan and a fancy big hospital and maybe like a thousand specialists and every medicine you could think of to treat her? Probably not, right? What we needed to help Coco was this. We needed a microscope. And what it took was a skin scrape to see that she had Demodex, and then she needed this. And that really was what Coco needed, right? This is basic care. This is a history, signalment, and physical exam with a little bit of tests. And I'll be honest with you, we probably could have gotten to this conclusion without a microscope if we needed to, just based on signalment alone and what her skin looked like. You remember what Coco looked like before? This is Coco now. Yeah, this is like end of the day happy tale. Yes. 
So I'm confused. You said that he already used up all his funds on vet care, correct? Yes. Do you ha have any idea why the previous veterinarian couldn't diagnose this and treat it properly? That for me, so the question was, how come the previous veterinarian didn't come to this conclusion and get Coco treated? And that's actually a million dollar question that I don't know the answer to. My suspicion is that Coco received some care, but there may have been follow-up visits that were needed and the, the owner had run out of funds. And that's actually going to bring me to a topic for a little bit later in the lecture today about communication. Again, I don't know the details of what happened prior to Antonio and Coco coming to, to us, but there is a huge piece of basic veterinary care that in my mind is communication. It has nothing to do with whether you have Otamax or some other ear medicine or whether, which antibiotic is on your shelf. It has to do with um, client discussion and bringing the client into the treatment plan and discussing. But I think it's an excellent question that I, I myself was wondering. Any other comments, thoughts? Yes? I'd say uh, the question she was asking is something that happens a lot in our area too. And in what we way? Well, in the way that we wonder how come there were so many diagnostic and was it the way we are educated as veterinarians that we feel like we have to take a man step to get a diagnostic? Yeah, or so do I don't, feel, I'm not sure, do I need to repeat the questions or are we good? Okay, okay, yeah, why don't you press the magic button. <laughs> so I was just saying that the comment that was uh, reported here seems to happen, we're in the Buffalo, New York area, and we do see a lot of patients at our shelter that might be surrendered for cost, and we see them and it feels like not rocket science, you know. Mm -hmm. We look at the patients and we're like, okay, we could do a lot of testing or we could go with a signalment and say, yeah. chances are with all the patients we've seen, this is what it is. So is it a broader question ethically? Do, do the veterinarians feel bad to go with the signalment only or not? And how does that help the owner population? Yeah, and, and I think you, you bring up an excellent point that's gonna take us on a little sidetrack, but I think that's okay. Um, again, we're in a room with veterinarians, so we're like amongst our people. That, uh, you know, I graduated 20 years ago, and at that time, you know, yes, we, there were a lot of specialists, and we were, you know, taught the gold standard of, you know, what, uh, you know, a basic information is. But I feel like I've seen over the years that there's this expectation that unless you do the sort of this minimum baseline of whatever it may be testing wise, then we're not providing adequate care. And I think there's a huge uh, opportunity as veterinarians for us to get together and say like, let's go back to history and physical exam and signalment and use testing when it's needed. And, and, and honestly, if, if we could have the platinum plan for everyone, that would be fabulous, but that's not real life. And for Coco, it could have been the difference between nothing or the platinum plan, I don't know. But there probably was somewhere in the middle that we could have met. And actually, that will probably be like the last slide when we talk. No, no this is perfect, because I think we're all on the same page. That there is sort of this, like, how can we get to the place we need to to help animals without feeling this burden on ourselves that maybe we're not doing the right thing? Are we going to be judged by other veterinarians? And so we need to support each other to get to that place. So basically, Veterinary care. So for the veterinarians in the room, I think some of you said that you are already providing basic care. Um, can I maybe get like one or two people just say like what basic care you are providing? Any hands? Okay, yes. Can you press the button to talk? Thanks. To record it. We do surgeries, spay and neuter, and also some other surgeries. Um, we'll do wellness clinics, medical exams, we'll provide vaccinations, nail trims, ear checks. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. Like, like that's a, so for basic medical care, that's for you. Kind of what what feels right for for your clinic. Anyone else? Nails. What's that? Nails. Nails. Yes. Who doesn't have an animal come into their spay neuter clinic for a spay neuter appointment? And what the owner really wants to talk to them about is getting a nail trim. <laughs> if you do not nail trim the nails, then that service is not good enough. So basic veterinary care can involve so many different varieties of care. Um, things like vaccinations would be sort of that standard kind of preventive, let's not have animals get parvo um, and pan-luke. 
Let's treat parasites, you know, every puppy, let's get some dewormer into them. Um, and then like the simple stuff, uh, you know, the little bit of a head cold, goopy eyes, um, basic skin and ear conditions. Um, some short-term pain management, I think, fits in basic care. You know, the animal that has like a sprain and needs a few days of, of pain relief. Um, as important uh, in the work that I've been doing is incorporating humane euthanasia into basic care with the idea that in addition to providing care for animals for uh, their needs in their life is also providing the owner and the family and the animal with a uh, supported, compassionate end of life. Triaging animals for additional care, that I think also falls into basic care because you may see animals where you actually can't provide the service they need, but you're able to inform the owner about what's going on. And that goes back to the communication piece. The animal that comes in that's limping, do you suspect it has a cruciate rupture? Or do you suspect it just has a little soft tissue, you know, pain and a few days of anti-inflammatories will do the job? That's information that you can provide to the owner <coughs> to provide some, <coughs> some relief. <coughs> so I'm just going to grab my water on that thought. I've been talking a lot this afternoon. In addition, spay-neuter. I want us to not forget about spay-neuter. Spay-neuter has sort of become like a common thing that we do, but really it also falls into basic care, preventive care, prevent those parvo, uh, sorry, those pyometras and other medical conditions related to um, the reproductive tract. So let's talk next about roadblocks. So it's all very nice that, you know, these are basic services and it seems like, well, it's pretty basic. You know, why don't people just get these services? What's the big deal? The reality is there are a lot of roadblocks for people to be able to bring their animals for care. And I'm gonna run you through a few statistics just to bring this home. There was a publication recently uh, on access to basic, access to veterinary care um, put out by the University of Tennessee. <coughs> they have a group called the Access to Veterinary Care Coalition. And they did a survey, um, again, this was published this, this year. And in that survey across the US, 28% of all pet owners surveyed experienced a barrier to veterinary care in the last two years. Now this was not a survey of people in low income communities, this was not a survey of people in areas where there, only, there was no veterinarian. This is all. So we're talking about a quarter of the people surveyed said there was some barrier. Can anyone guess what the greatest barrier to care was? Shout out. Money. Money. Eighty percent of pet owners reported that there was a financial barrier. And again, I'm going to say it one more time. This is a survey not just of what we think of as low income or uh, generational poverty areas. This is everybody. So veterinary care has been difficult for people to access, and that includes basic services. This is not a new issue, not new-ish. Um, again, this, this study that came out um, in 2018, if you have not seen it yet, I encourage you to look at it. Thank you so much. There are also papers in JAVMA from 2016 and 2018, back to basics. You know, veterinarians look at fundamentals to help underserved afford care, what are the barriers. There's lots of research. It's a very hot topic right now in veterinary medicine. Within this project that was done, they also tried to get a sense of how many animals are we talking about. So we said about a quarter of the people surveyed said they had some sort of barrier. So they took all the numbers and math, which I am certainly not going to go through, um, but I know Dr. Slater's in the room, who is our epidemiologist at the ASPCA. When I have numbers, I just talk to her because I, don't, I can't do that. Um, and they took the numbers and looked through you know, how many pets per household and how, what percentage of households have pets, and they came to a number just under 30 million. Well, I will tell you that there is no program in the United States that is going to be able to care for 30 million animals on their own. And that number is just too big a number for me to even think about. So I said, let's, let's talk New York City. That's what I know. And in New York City, the estimates based on similar numbers 
looking at pets per household, um, the, I believe the level of uh, population um, at, or I think it's two times or less poverty levels, and the number comes out to about 385,000 households who have dogs and cats have financial barriers to access veterinary care in New York City. So again, 385,000, that is a whole lot of dogs and cats. Let's see how we can help at least some of them. But we're not gonna be able to help them all. And I think to go into this saying, I'm really excited about providing basic care, I'm gonna help every dog and cat in New York City, I would not be in a good place thinking about that. But I can think about how can I go from taking a community where there is no veterinary services and bring some veterinary services. And that's the approach that I encourage people to take to make it not feel like uh, this huge big bad problem to try to solve. Maybe we can try to solve it just a little bit at a time. And how do we do that? How do we figure out where we should be going and what services we should be providing? So again, to the audience, for um, groups that are doing this work, how did you decide what to do, what to add, whether to do a vaccine clinic, whether to add soft tissue surgery? Anyone from the audience? I'll pick on you, because you spoke, spoke before. I mean, we, we have different management and planning teams, and I think they feel that one part of our initiative is community service, community outreach. So we'll do vaccination clinics um, every Tuesday of the week in our county community. And we'll do the first Saturday of every month. We collaborate with the local banks in the Delaware community. <coughs> and then we'll do, for our fundraisers, we'll usually also have like an off-site clinic there with one of the events. So we try to do community outreach. We also do for the poor. Um, we have some areas that are very, very poor and they can't afford. So we have certain programs we'll try to do fundraising or if there's a grant for it, we'll go out and transport some of their animals for spay and neuter. Um, I'm not usually involved in the actual determining <coughs> priority part of it, but I think when we have those resources, I feel like when we, we feel we have the resource, we want to always apply that as part of our mission and we just did a really big renovation years it's an ongoing campaign it's from us and we, we felt that we got a lot of donations a lot of donors and we wanted to also be able to provide that in our numbers. Oh, great great so yeah it's, it's, it's yeah it sounds like what I'm, what I'm gathering from what you're saying is you looked into the community saw what was needed saw what partnerships may have already been there and built on those and then you know had looked for the funding to make sure that it could happen Great. It, it, I get the vibe that in, in the sheltering world, which is actually the one place, honestly, I have not worked. I worked in private practice, and I've been in high-quality, high-volume spay-neuter worlds. But I, I'm getting the vibe in the shelter world that this movement towards what can we do to help people keep their pets has been really embraced. It's a big shift. Um, and this is, I think, where you can take that idea and put basic care together and there, there are some other research that really talk about how like when people talk about like why they're relinquishing ability to get veterinary care is huge I think I saw a hand up here yeah um, so we have started offering community outreach wellness clinics and part of the way that we identified there was a need for that is that we have a local pets in need clinic that does income qualification and we found out that they were booking out six to eight weeks in advance for any kind of appointment, even for animals that were like in dire need of medical care. So we realized that there was definitely a need for that in our community and we're, we do not income qualify. I know that's like a kind of controversial topic, but now these animals are able to get some like time, more timely care, which I think is really important. Great, so you saw need. Like the need, like the, another group was like overflowing and you're like, the need is there. Terrific. So there's so many different ways to approach this. And one thing when I was putting this talk together, you'll notice on purpose, there are no slides that are a cookbook recipe on how to do basic veterinary care. This is not the, the uh, lecture to come into where I say, get these three antibiotics, 
these two pain relievers have this size syringe and open from these hours because it is so specific to what the community needs. And in this example, you're talking about both there was human health needs as well as animal health needs, it sounds like, and that was one way to address it. So what we did in, in the primary pet care program, which I'll tell you about, um, we had been doing spay neuter for 20 years. And in those 20 years, the, we, had mobile, we have mobile clinics that go out into the community, and specifically we've chosen areas to go to that are underserved. And we have a terrific research department that looks at all sorts of data, looks at shelter intake, where there are veterinarians or not veterinarians, um, where there is persistent poverty, and layers all this information together to show us where are these hot spots, where are these areas of what we believe to be significant need. So rather than reinvent the wheel, when three years ago we decided to start our basic medical services, our pri which we call primary pet care, we said, let's just go to those same neighborhoods. Let's keep it simple. And that's what we did. So this is a map of New York City. Let's see. Oh, I can do this down here. This is great. Um, can I do this down here? I'll do it up here. So New York City, here's Manhattan, there's Central Park, pretty cool, Statue of Liberty, I don't know where she is, somewhere down here. Um, this is the South Bronx, and then this is uh, Central Brooklyn, particularly East New York, and all those uh, little light blue dots are where our mobile clinics go. And we already knew from collecting data from the clients coming in, um, you know, who are, are you on public assistance? Um, you know, things like that, that these were areas of need. So we started going there with our mobile clinics into those two areas, and those light, those blue dots are our primary pet care clinics. And since we were already used to being on mobile clinics to go into the area, we decided to continue doing that. So we were serving the people, the residents of the East New York, Brooklyn area, and the South Bronx. In addition to that, we were also providing services for referrals from social service agencies. So this is similar, this is how Antonio and Coco came to us, was he came into the uh, local animal shelter, uh, the city uh, shelter, and um, they were able to divert him to our program to get care um, so Coco could stay with him. <clears throat> And again, we opted to go with a mobile clinic program. It's what we know. We knew we, being in the communities was very valuable. In addition to financial resources, another, or financial barriers, another barrier that people commonly uh, speak to is transportation. And certainly in New York City, if you have a large dog, you are not taking that dog on the subway. And if you don't have a car, you are definitely not getting that dog anywhere. So we saw that using a mobile clinic was a way for us to both address transportation as an issue, and then by providing, um, in this case, we provide subsidized services, we were able to also address the financial situation. There was another reason why using the mobile clinics was a great opportunity for us, and it was because it allowed us to put some parameters on what we were gonna do. Our instinct, if you're anything like every veterinarian I know, is we wanna help everyone. And it's very hard to say no. Um, there's a reason I'm not a practice owner. Uh, I should not be the one just making all those financial decisions. And so having a mobile clinic allowed us to say, we're going to start with something little where we're going to provide outpatient care. It's our exam room on wheels. And anything we can do within an exam room is what we're going to do. We're not keeping animals and sedating them for procedures. We are not keeping animals for overnight care because our program is not possible to do that in a mobile clinic. And I think it was a really good way for us to be able to introduce this to our staff who had been doing spay neuter only for what felt like a thousand years and saying we're branching out into this different world. So these are this uh, example of our primary pet care clinic where we roll up to uh, uh, regular locations in the South Bronx and East New York. Um, we see people by, by appointment um, certainly there's groups that do things first come, first serve. Um, we have opted to do by appointment for a variety of reasons. Uh, and if you are looking to expand your program, continue your program, um, one recommend, recommendation I can make is to just make things as simple as possible. And one, another way we have done that is by keeping our medical record really simple. Lots and lots of check boxes, um, again, 
graduating from veterinary school, you know, the SOAP is everything. And the SOAP has to include every differential diagnosis that you can think of. Um, I had to retrain a lot of our staff to be like, don't write anything. <laughs> like, write like one line. Uh, and, and it's on purpose that we've made it. There's not a lot of room to write on the medical record. We want to keep it simple. And we really focus on communication. Uh, I can't stress this enough that what I think is the heart and soul of the work of what we do is the connections. It's um, our veterans is Dr. Uh, Bruno and Dr. Sarter meeting with clients. And that photo of Dr. Bruno is like my favorite photo in the world because she is not talking down to this person. She is on their level. She's looking at the owner, not just the dog. Um, and really talking to them. And there is, if we're going to move away in some situations from all of our diagnostic tests, then we have to gather information from somewhere. And that's through a really thorough history, um, physical exam, and looking at the signalment of the animal, and really listening to what the owners are telling us. Because no matter what we know about veterinary medicine, the owner always knows more about their animal. Of course, yes. Um, I'm from the Metro New York area. I'm used to looking at these maps. Um, what kind of staff training do you do for your staff for potentially tough situations? Or, I mean, it's an issue. I work in a southern shelter, and it's certainly an issue for us in the southern shelter. So how do you ensure staff safety when you're going out and trying to do good things? Excellent question. Uh, so the question is about safety going into communities where there is uh, I don't know what, what the right way to say it is, that where there, there could be issues. I mean, honestly, there could be issues anywhere. Um, and certainly, New York City is a high density of people. Um, we are there in daytime, is one thing. Um, we generally have um, the staff, nobody's alone. We have a team of three people who are there. And I will tell you that 99%, 99.9% 9 of the people are so welcoming thankful, grateful. We have people bringing us homemade food, bringing us cookies, coming by to say hello. So we really haven't had issues. Um, I will say also, we do not take money. There's no cash on the clinic. And we have very limited controlled drugs. So there is nothing there I think that anyone would really want. Um, and even on our mobile spay neuter clinics, we are very careful. We keep very little controlled drugs, maybe a day's worth or two days worth of controlled drugs on the clinic. So we're trying to make it not, um, <clears throat> not uh, something people would be looking to uh, create a situation. There's a second piece to that, which is the um, customer service piece of it. Um, and uh, again, off track a little bit, but our mobile spay neuter clinic program is first come, first serve, unlike primary pet care that's by appointment. And I will tell you, we have situations in the early morning, we have people waiting 2, 3, 4 a.m. to try to get on the clinic, and people get crabby. Uh, and we have done a lot of training with our staff around customer service, uh, how to diffuse situations, and we have made it very clear to our staff that if there is ever an issue where they in any way feel unsafe, um, call 911. Our approach is, again, this, we're not going to treat everything. So we're going to treat a lot. Um, but the things that we are not going to treat, what do we do with them? Uh, it, we're incredibly fortunate in New York City that the ASPCA runs a full service hospital. And so if there are cases where um, we have an animal that needs more diagnostics or care, we can refer them there. There are some limits to that um, in terms of uh, the ASPCA funding around um, focusing on treatable conditions that will likely have a good outcome. So I'll be honest with you, there are some cases we, we cannot treat and what we have to provide for the owners is information. So there may be an animal come in that we are very suspicious is a diabetic and we check their urine and there's sugar in it. And we don't treat chronic conditions like that. And so what we've been able to provide for the owner is information. And for there, they can then um, access additional services if they're able to from their own sources. We also offer humane euthanasia. So there may be situations where uh, it is in a situation such that the reality is the owner cannot manage this situation and we will provide humane euthanasia. It doesn't happen very often, but it is a touchy subject for sure.
Yeah. How do you address uh, recurrent skin and ear, you know, allergies, um, all the maintenance, and potentially uh, resistant infections and things like yeah. that? It's the bane of our existence. Yeah, yeah the, re the reoccurring infections. And the approach that we've taken is we don't treat chronic conditions, but we will treat recurring, sort of. So, for example, <laughs> if an animal gets an ear infection every fall, because they probably have some sort of allergy, We'll treat that infection, and they can come back next fall, and we'll treat it again. But if we, that animal has a skin infection, and every month they're coming back with the same infection, and unfortunately, at a certain point, we do cut off the care. And again, what I, what I like to focus on is we have provided them with a ton of information about what's wrong with their animal, what, what could our potential treatments. Maybe there's like that sort of not the platinum plan, but not zero around antihistamines or something like that. But if you speak with any of the community medicine veterinarians, they will tell you the skin stuff drives them bananas. Because there's, I mean, I had an allergic dog that I spent a gazillion dollars on, and he still wasn't fine. So it's not just about the money part of it, but it's certainly, it, it, it is a piece. And we don't treat everything. And that's been a really hard thing, I think, to, a pill to swallow for some of our staff. And I, I again, have to reinforce that in these communities we were in, there was zero. And so we're providing some. It's frustrating, for sure. So for any of you who, were, I should change the slide to not just starting your own basic care program, but like continuing your basic care program, adjusting your basic care program, keeping it growing and building, what, what you need to do. So first thing is, just figuring out what your community needs. And it sounds like, again, preaching to the choir, so many of you in the audience have already done this. You've been at vaccine events. You've spoken with people in your community and said, you know, we're booked six weeks out for something. And I can't tell you how important that is. There was a, another talk that uh, I was in just before this talking about a uh, municipal shelter in Texas. And what they saw was they had animals being relinquished because the owners found out they were heartworm positive and they couldn't afford care. So what this municipal shelter decided to do was start offering heartworm tests and some version of heartworm treatment. Probably not the platinum, but not zero, and hopefully keeping those pets in the home. The second thing is just start simple. Again, if you're already offering some basic care services, maybe at some point you think, what else could we add that makes sense, that isn't a huge big deal? If you're not yet providing any basic services, think about that vaccine event that you could tag along onto. Um, I, again, made reference in the previous lecture to uh, a program in New York City where the New York City Department of Health was running vaccine events to provide rabies vaccines. They were organizing it. They had the staff. They had everything. They came to us and said, would you guys like to give the distemper vaccine? because they couldn't give it, because it was a city uh, human health program. So basically, all I had to provide was a couple of veterinarians and uh, a box of vaccines. And we were able to create this great synergy with the New York City Department of Health at a relatively simple way for us to do it. So I encourage you to think about, about the simple things to add. And I, I didn't know in this group whether or not there would be a situation where veterinarians you know, wanted to provide services, but whether there were restrictions around you know, what um, the shelter is already providing or their funding restrictions. So if it ever were to come up that you are thinking, oh, I'd love to add something, but we don't have it in the budget. Starting simple with something small, one thing, a pilot program, so you're not trying to sell to um, the powers that be some great grand thing that you're going to do forever, can be a great way to show um, interest and demonstrate the need when all of a sudden you have 100 people lined up for a vaccine event. And just know that there's going to be adjustments along the way. When we started the primary pet care program, very naively, I had this vision in my head that we were gonna go into these communities and it was gonna be this dramatic thing of people running to the clinic with animals in their arms, desperately needing care, and we went through a, I can remember an entire meeting that was just dedicated to how were we gonna transport animals on emergency to our hospital. 
I think we've done it once in three years. That wasn't what the need was. So when we realized that what people needed was the basics, they needed vaccines, they needed uh, a little bit of, not grooming, but nail trims, and people needed to learn how to do nail trims, they needed their stinky ears dealt with, that that whole idea around transport, we're like, oh, that was really good, we planned it, but we actually didn't really need it. And so expect that there are gonna be moments of change. And if you do some of these things, I think it will help you not feel like that, like crazed about it, and be a little sort of like, it's okay, we can, we can do this. And a big piece of it too is uh, what we referenced earlier in the conversation around like, how do you kind of let other people know that it's okay to just treat the dog for Demodex? My God, it's a four month old pit bull puppy who's got stinky skin, it's got Demodex. Or it has mange, like sarcoptic mange, well, or it has something else, but you know what, it's probably all treated with Perfecto and everything is fine. How do we get there? And I think that's as a community, as a veterinary community, we need to uh, cut ourselves a little slack, have the conversation and tell each other that it's okay. So with that, you know, I mentioned earlier there were 385,000 dogs and cats in New York City that needed help. I have not helped all those animals, but I, our program at the ASPCA did help about 7,000 of them, almost. And you know, uh, Coco, who I mentioned earlier, you know, like that's just one, but that's like one much happier pit bull now that's feeling much better. So we're not, you know, we didn't solve it. You know, I'm not coming up here saying we made it all the way to B with all the animals, but I know we're not at A anymore, which is great. Um, and I wish it was this really great linear path of like, hey, let's just do this and we're gonna get to that, but it's not. It's this, it's <laughs> messy, it's really messy. And we're somewhere in the middle. Uh, and I think this is not something that when I went to veterinary school, we talked about, I mean, it was just, you go into private practice. That's kind of just what you did. And the private practices were all concentrated in areas where there were uh, people who had the means to provide the care. And what we're realizing now is there's this whole segment of the population that we need to adjust to. Because the reality is people have pets. They love their pets. Their pets are family. And the fact that there are issues around the financial means to pay for care has nothing to do with whether these animals are family members and provide wonderful uh, things to the owners. The owners provide wonderful things to these animals. And I think if we can work together on this, we can you know, make some movement. And um, Coco would like you to be part of the solution on all of this. So with that, I thank you. I am here if you want to talk anymore. Um, and really thank you for showing up for the last presentation of the day. Thank you.